You're welcome. Thanks a lot for, to stay to stay with us. I am very uh, very happy to um, welcome and to um, to say thanks again to Giacomo Rizzolati uh, for his uh, presence inside this space, this room, virtual room, even if a virtual room. Um, thanks to the student uh, of uh, the NAD master that is following the lesson, and also um, to the the holders uh, that uh, slowly is coming into the room to follow the, the same lesson um, from all from all the for many, I would say, for many at least uh, side of the, of the world. Uh, this lesson uh, um, would be devoted to deepen the creativity and motor connection issues. And um, Giacomo Rizzolatti uh, surely uh, doesn't need to be introduced, uh, but anyway, I'd like to, to do it uh, very much. And so I have to at least to say that Giacomo Rizzolatti is the well-known uh, father of the neuro, neuro neurons uh, in uh, uh, this, you know, is one of the most important uh, discovery in uh, the last uh, thir at least three decades in, in the neuroscience field. It, it is uh, and it's so important that uh, it uh, uh, changes the, the perspective in many um, correlated areas. Uh, of, no, of knowledge and of well beyond the neuroscience field, uh, strictly in turn. Um, and so this is a, for us in a, in a very important occasion to deepen with him uh, and uh, some, uh, um, some uh, contents, uh, uh, as for example, what means uh, uh, creativity in our, in our, in our, uh, in our approach, uh, and which is the relation between creativity and motor cognition. Uh, because, uh, you know, frequently we, we mention, uh, we mention that the motor cognition as a trigger of knowledge, a very important trigger of knowledge. I don't want to add to, to, many, to many others uh, words to the presentation. I don't want to bore you Absolutely, <laughs> and so I thank, thanking uh, again uh, Giacomo for his presence uh, inside our room. I leave the room to him, and thanks to everybody for your presence here. Thanks a lot. Thank you, David, for your presentation, and I am very sorry that we are not in contact. When I accepted uh, the invitation, I was sure <clears throat> that we will meet in Venice. But anyway, the situation is the following, and we cannot do anything. Uh, you already had some lecture on uh, nervous system. So my lecture today will be divided into two parts. In the first part, the longer one, <clears throat> I will present the mirror mechanism, and before that, some neurophysiological data to clarify what is the motor mechanism. In the second part, I will talk about the uh, creativity. The reason is that I thought that it's better to, to, to explain first the mirror mechanism, so it will be clearer for you what I mean by uh, creativity. Well, let me start from, <coughs> from the very beginning. I think you know from the lecture that you heard before that the nervous system is made by cells, by neurons. And these neurons talk one with another by generating action potential. You see here, action potential recorded from a peripheral nerve. What you can notice immediately is the amplitude is practically the same. The oscillation you see is due to noise. So what is the code? The code of uh, the neuron, it's frequency, the frequency change. And you can see the lowest part of the figure that uh, there is uh, 
increase of frequency, decrease of frequency, and so on. But the basic idea is that amplitude does not change. In this case, the registration is made from a peripheral nerve. <laughs> but if I put an electrode in the visual area, in the auditory area, in the motor cortex, doesn't matter. I will always find the same type of language, always action potential, and also the same logic. They increase in uh, frequency if I put the appropriate stimulus. This technique started from the second half of the last century and allowed many discovery about the property. For example, in the visual area, not all neurons respond just to flash of light. That was a surprise. Some of them uh, discharge in response to a colored stimulus, some even to complex stimulus like a face. Uh, what about the motor cortex? The motor cortex traditionally was considered something which produces movement. Here is the classical definition that I took from the book of Mountcastle, a classical physiology book. And Hahnemann wrote, the motor system, the brain, exists to translate thought, sensation, and emotion into movement. So the idea is that or the motor system, it's not involved in any of higher function, no thought, no sensation, no emotion, <clears throat> but only in the production of movement. As you will see in a moment, that's not completely true. That what we have found in our experiment is the motor system is much more complex and involved also in cognition. Well, what is the motor system, first of all? Here it's a brain, uh, human brain, and the motor areas are indicated with area four and six. That's the classical map of uh, Broadway. At the beginning of the century, he described all these areas of the brain, including two which have some specific characteristics, and their stimulation determines movement. So four and six are movement. However, under anatomists already in the 30s and the 40s were unsatisfied with this too simple modification or classification. In the 70s and 80s, many people start to look at this issue more deeply. And in Parma, especially thanks to Mattelli and Mitch Klickstein, we proposed the following classification. <clears throat> so the rostral part, this part here of the brain, is the motor cortex. And you can see that here, there are seven areas, including this part here. F, it, it means frontal, and we took it from von Economo, who call it also FA, FB, FC, we call it F1. And that was very important, because if you don't have a good anatomy, you cannot have a good physiology. So if you have a good physiology, then everybody can repeat a good anatomy, everybody can repeat your experiment. So in this case, I am interested today in one specific area, which is indicated by the arrow now, which is area F5. We use it, the technique I already mentioned, it, single neural recording, but in addition, unlike most of students of motor system, we use an etological approach. So instead of uh, studying uh, velocity of the movement, uh, acceleration, kinematics in general, we observe it, what happens when the monkey play with object, take it from us, eat them, and so on. We call it this etological approach. And I must say that this etological approach has been very fruitful we discovered many interesting things. One, it's already represented here. Uh, the dots that you see are action potential. Uh, the histogram is the sum of all these trials. So we have 10 trials and then we sum it. Uh, here is the histogram. What you can see here, which for all physiologists and neurologists was a big surprise, that this neuron fire became active when the monkey grasped with the right hand and with the left hand. Furthermore, a specific type of grip is important. It's called a precision grip when the monkey grasp with the index finger and with the, 
with the index. Now, the most interesting is here that the same neurons or another neurons fire in this case, both when the monkey grasps with the right hand, with the left hand, or with the mouth. So here we change it radically the idea that motor cortex just produce movement, produces something else. And we call it, it motor action, motor act. <clears throat> this term, as a matter of fact, was introduced at first by Michael Arby, who is professor in, as you see, in Los Angeles. And what it means, motor act? It means that several movements are organized in such a way to reach a goal. So we have to reach a goal. What is called that it's not movement, but the goal of movement is called the motor act. Here is what motor acts. <clears throat> what is the advantage of the motor act? It allows a goal generalization. Look at these experiments, which is very interesting. Here the monkey was learned to use pliers. And one set of pliers in the upper row are normal pliers. You grasp an object when you close your hand. But in B, there is these crazy pliers. So they become active if you use something opposite. When you open the hand, like here, like here, the object is grasped. <clears throat> so movement here are not so important. The goal is important. If the goal is grasping, you can see. Now I will show you the result. First, I will show you how monkey is able to use this instrument. What you will see here, here is the actual potential. Tuck, 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 tuck. Actual potential are transform it into sound through a loudspeaker. So every tack, 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 it's an action potential. And stronger is the discharge, stronger is the action, or more effective is the action. What is that in your room? Now he's using You see that when the monkey is just moving the plier, there is nothing. But when he or she reaches the goal, there is a discharge. Here it was very clear. He was reaching nervously the pliers, but there was nothing in terms of action potential. <clears throat> so the first discovery was that part of the motor cortex encodes the goal of the action. You will see the importance of this when I will arrive to the mirror neurons. That was another big surprise that many neurons respond, have visual properties. Remember that I am recording here from the motor cortex, but the responses also are to visual, to visual stimuli. The first type of neuron which respond to visual stimuli, we call them canonical neurons, are neurons which discharge when you present a stimulus which is congruent with the type of movement or motor act which is encoded. You see here is the best example. Here the monkey saw a ring and there is discharge when she grasps the ring. Other stimuli also are effective, but in the very moderate uh, terms. Here you see an excellent response. What are these neurons? What, what are their purpose? The purpose is very simple. So when you see an object, you have a circuit in the brain, which include a parietal area called AAP, anterior intraparietal, and the motor area, which I described now. So you have an immediate capacity to transform an object into motor act. Uh, we call them canonical because some psychologists uh, speculated that should be such a mechanism in order to be able, uh, that we enable us to grasp an object without thinking about that. So I see an object and immediately I have inside my brain a head grip which is useful to grasp this object. 
We worked on this issue with the Japanese group Sakata, who studied these neurons in the parietal lobe. So we really were able to draw a network which go from parietal until the frontal lobe. <clears throat> but up to now, it was very interesting. People discussed this issue, but then it was the big surprise, mirror neurons. So in this case, uh, what is important, not the observation of an object, but an observation of an action made by another person. So in this case, the um, experimenter in A grasped something, and in B, he observed the monkey grasping an object. So there is this parallelism between what he observing, what he's observing, and what the monkey is doing. Now I will show a mirror neuron. <clears throat> Again, what you will hear will be tak, 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 tak. So the action potential amplified and put into mm, loudspeaker. Uh, what you have to do is to correlate the sound, this tak, 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 with the action that you will observe. Grasping you know. Up to now, it's not a fashion. Grasping neurons. Uh, here is the mirror effect. It's same neuron. This is like a dialogue. So here there are many things that describe well the mirror neurons. The first it was a bit boring to show you some several, several trials, but it indicates how repetitive is the phenomenon. We don't need to make some analysis of variance or other complex uh, analysis to show that the neuron fire both when the observer is doing an action or the uh, monkey is doing this action. <clears throat> then there is very nice this correspondence. So it's the same action which determine the activity of the neurons, done or observed. And finally, somebody could be surprised, but I hope not, also grasping with the mouth was sufficient to excite the neuron. Why? Because what it's encoded is the motor act. It's grasping. Doesn't matter if it's grasping with the right hand, with the left hand, or even with the mouth. That was very important was our initial discovery that this neuron encode the motor act rather than the movement. So at this point, we studied this. And we discovered something which will be important when I will talk about creativity. There are some neurons which we call it broadly tuned. So if you look at these panels here, C is the monkey grasping, D is monkey grasping, but no response. It's a precision grip neuron. It's very specific for that. But during the observation, it's the same thing. You see that it doesn't matter how it grasps. You can see both uh, the activity when uh, the monkey observes the experimenter grasping with the whole hand or only with the finger. <clears throat> Some of them, however, were extremely strictly tuned, like this one. This one was one of those neurons that convinced us that we are really see something strange. It's only when you break an object, there is a discharge. Grasping, you can see, is nothing. So there is only breaking and in a specific section. This we call it strictly tuned, 
neuron. Well, that's our old experiment done at the end of the century. That's something very recent done by Bonini, essentially, was the guy who did most of the experiment in which we changed the electrode. This was a technical big advancement because now we can record simultaneously from many electrodes. And when you see this reddish stuff here, is that in this part of the brain, there are plenty of mirror neurons. Here, no, here again, yes. So thanks to this technique, one can record a lot of neurons without staying until in the night in order to have a couple of them. Well, this also allowed us to give some number, for example, in RN5, out of 676 neurons, purely motor are the majority, but there are many mirror neurons and there are some canonical neurons. Well, that's one can say, but what, what does it mean? It can, cannot be just in an area or two areas which uh, respond in this way. This is a study which we did 10 years ago, approximately, with the Belgian group, the student one, Ken Nelson, who did that. And this Belgian group was extremely clever because allowed us, and they, of course, also to use uh, um, fMRI. If you are a bit uh, acquainted with fMRI, one of the problem is that somebody who is inside the tube should be absolutely still. Because if you move, you change the, the magnetic field. And so you have artifact. So the patient, for example, when go in the uh, tube, one said, please don't move absolutely and so on. Well, with monkey, it seems almost impossible. But this young guy, Nelson, thought that maybe we can do the following, to put first the monkey, not in a real tube, but in a black box, in a box. And uh, the monkey is fixating a small light. When the light change colors, she has to push a button and receive a reward. At this point, after some training, after two weeks, three weeks of training, the monkey likes very much to stay in this box because she receives a reward and we can record from its brain. The movie that we show to the monkey is very boring, but the monkey doesn't care. The monkey cares essentially about food. So the monkey is caring about food, but its brain received this input that you see here, grasping with the hand, or the, or the girl grasping an object. I don't go into detail, but that's allowed us to describe the whole circuit. What you see here in the lowest part, it's called a supplementary temporal um, sulcus. And in this area, STS, uh, there is no motor activity. The motor activity start to be here in the parietal lobe, and then it's continued to be in the frontal lobe. So the circuit start with the description, purely visual description of an object, even complex one like hand or face, but then it adds motor activity here and here. And so we know that the capacity of generating uh, mirror neurons is due to interactivity of this different zone. Here is a schematic thing. You see V1 is purely visual. Then it goes to STS. It goes to IP, which I already mentioned it, and then go here. So we have a network which allow us to transform the visual uh, stimulus into a motor counterpart. Before discussing what it means, why we have this neuron, what is the purpose, Let's go to the humans, because as soon as we discovered uh, this phenomenon in monkeys, we said well, it's true also for humans. And fortunately, in Milano, there was a center at the hospital San Raffaele, and we asked it to, to do the experiment on humans. So a person, that was a positive revision tomography experiment, a PET experiment. So it was placed at the student inside the tube. We injected some material. And if there was an increase of blood, 
this part of the brain became of different color. And you see here that in also human, there is an activity when it observes, when the subject observes an action in the parietal lobe and in F5 and adjacent areas. That was very old experiment done 20 years ago. Subsequently, myself, but many other people did experiment on this issue using both positron emission tomography and also fMRI. fMRI is a technique which does not require radioactive activity and thanks to some trick that phys physicists invented, you can see where there is an increase of blood. And you can see that's done in Zurich in Germany, where it's a very important center for this type of study. And what you see here is the visual area. Of course, if you see a, no, an action, the visual area is active. And then you have the areas which are described in the monkey, the parietal, and here the promoter. That's very recent stuff, again, done in Germany in which you have in yellow indicated the area which became active during action execution, action observation, and motor imagery. That's again, arm and hand movement. It's interesting that motor imagery determine activation very similar to action observation. Uh, it's important to stress that motor imagery is not imagine Rolando playing soccer but you have to imagine yourself doing something. It's you doing something. It's not that you observe some other. Let's call it motor imagery by Genero and by others. So if I imagine myself grasping uh, an apple, the activity is very similar when I observe somebody grasping it and actual execution is here. This technique now, we started to apply to patient because thanks to this superposition, you can motor because an imaging something without moving and you activate the motor cortex and can be very useful for rehabilitation. Well, now, <clears throat> after the discovery of mirror neuron, the people start to say, well, you said that you use mirror mechanism, but uh, why? Why you use mirror mechanism, not something else? So we did a simple experiment that was done in Parma some years ago. Student is lying in the tube, in the scanner, fMRI experiment. And we present the movies. The first movie is a boy biting and the dog biting. First part of the experiment. Second part of the experiment, we will show something which is species specific. So the boy will observe somebody reading, lip reading, there is no sound, or will observe this monkey doing what is called a lip smacking in etology. It's sound like that. The monkey does to say, well, you know, I am not your enemy, we are friends, stay cold and so on. And the dog will bark. So in the first part of the experiment are motor programs, which are common to all three species. The boy is able to bite, the monkey can bite, the dog can bite. The second part of the experiment was something which is specific for each species. Here are the results. <coughs> Biting. If you look at the hemisphere on this side, the left hemisphere, which is the more motor hemisphere, you see there is practically the same thing. So when I see a dog biting or a ma man biting or a monkey, I have the activation of the same areas. So for me, this dog is like a human. I understand the action because it's inside myself. Look here. When <clears throat> there is lip reading, there is a strong activation of the left hemisphere in humans. The student try to understand what is said uh, silently. But look at the dog. All of them, all students understood the dog was barking. 
although there was no bow bow how how was only the, the, the vision of Martin, but there is nothing. So what it means? It means that we have two radically different ways to understand action of others. One is phenomenological, it's empathic. I understand you because I have in myself the same project. And the other is logical, inferential. I make inferences and understand that. So I understand dot barking, not because I have myself a motor program for barking. As I said before, as I made sound before, I can say bow bow, how how. In any language, uh, there is a different way to express dog barking. But uh, there is nothing in our brain in this sense. So with Corrado Sirigaldi, a philosopher from Milano, we decided to call the phenomenological capacity to represent action, like understanding others from the inside. <clears throat> I understand you because what, what, because what you are doing is inside myself. The other is completely logical, like I understand the car is going or why the uh, airplane is flying. There are some physical law which you can explain me, I will understand. Here it's, it's in Italian, but you will understand that Edith Stein, Stein was a student of Husserl, and she said that I can feel pain when, when an animal is hit, but other things are outside my representation. A representation empty in my brain, I only can understand it logically. On this, I will come back later. Now, at this point, I can ask you, or ask myself, what is function role of mirror neurons? In a sense, I already told you, but there are two things. That's a very nice sentence by Marc Genero. A mere visual perception without involvement of motor system would only provide a description of the visible aspect of the movement of the agent, but it would not give precise information about the intrinsic component of the observed action, which are critical for understanding what the action is about, what is its goal, and how to reproduce it. Forget for the moment to reproduce it, imitation, I will talk about that, uh, about uh, creativity. But this is very important. So the pure visual information is not enough to understand what is going on. Instead, vice versa, if I have this system which allows me to understand phenomenological what is going on, well, I put you a simple example. You go into a bar and you see a guy grasping a glass of beer. You immediately understand what he's doing, not because you logically think, ah, it's a hand, the hand is moving, there is a beer, the, the hand is grasping the beer and so on but you have inside yourself, within yourself, the same motor program, which is immediately elicited by the observation. And without losing time, you have the precise knowledge of what the other guy is doing. There are other points which also are interesting. For example, <clears throat> the capacity to see the details. If some of you play some sport, you are much better in understanding the action of that sport than of a sport that you never played. For example, I can tell you I like soccer, as most Italian, so I can tell you if the action is good, if the goalkeeper made a good uh, stop of the ball and so on. But if I, at Olympic Games, I look at some sport, uh, which I don't know, I don't understand why they give so high mark to somebody and not to others. <clears throat> That's a very important point, but by the way. So more knowledge, more motor knowledge you have, better you understand the world around yourself. So two ways to understand the action of others. One is phenomenological from, as we said with Corrado, understanding others from the inside, and the other is purely logical, like we understand an apple falling down.
from a tree. Now, up to now, I have described only action, which are cold, let's say. There is no emotion involved, that the whole emotion. So we, in the last years, we also started to study emotions. Here you see a part of the brain. The brain has been open, and this part here uh, is, is called the insula. So together with some students, Caruana and Gezzini, we studied a basic emotion, disgust. <clears throat> People may be surprised, but that since the time of uh, Darwin, it's considered one of the basic emotions is disgust because it allows you to survive. If you see that somebody is eating something and then it's vomiting, you don't eat that and you will not vomit. Okay, disgust. So before studying disgust, we did a very careful exploration of the insula. Insula is that part of the brain which I showed you. So here it's flattened, so it's a bit different. But the point is that we put the electrode in all these parts that you see here, and we uh, describe it. What happens when we electrically stimulate? It should be careful, it's not recording here. Nothing is recorded. We stimulate and try to elicit a behavior in the animal. What is interesting for us, for our purpose now, is what happens when we stimulate this part, the red zone and the blue zone of the insula, the rostral part, the anterior part of the insula, and in particular, this red and blue zone. Now I will show the experiment. <clears throat> this time there is no action potential. So you will see the monkey, here is, and from time to time, here will appear a red light. Red light. Red light. So I think it's clear that every time we stimulate the insula, there is ingestive behavior. The monkey start to move the lip, the tongue, and so on. So we have, if I stimulate this red area, the dorsal area, there is ingestive positive behavior. Now I move my electron and go down, go to blue, here. Same logic, no spikes, but only behavior. Red light. Nice food. Red light. Nah. Another nice food. It's a peanut. No way. So he feels disgust because we stimulate, and although the stimulus is one of favorite of the monkey he rejected. Now he's eating. He has been reinforced. Red light. Look the surprise. So the monkey, it, it, it looks good, and then he became disgusted. Okay, so it's clear that, oh, again, no, but that's the beginning. So we have a part of the insula which produce positive ingested action, and the other negative disgust. Now, is the same true in humans. That's an experiment which we did in Marseille, in France, because in Marseille, there was a group, there is a group of scientists which are very good with odorant. Odorant for a physiologist is a nightmare because it's volatile, it go everywhere, it's a problem. But in this group in Marseille, the care and 
others. They were very good in that. So we did an fMRI experiment in, again, very interesting because it was subdivided in two parts. In the first part, we give in, in, inserted into the nose a tube and put some odorant, which could be pleasant, could be disgusting or nothing. And you see in this experiment, this red spot is the area which is active. This area here is the insula and the nostril part is exactly that part that I showed you a second ago. It was very active in determining disgust. Second part of the experiment, the actor of Marseille theater showed uh, expression, grimaces, which could be disgusted or it's not disgusting. He showed disgust. It's not disgusting per se, but he demonstrated disgust. The other guy is happy, pleasure, and the girl is neutral. And here are the results. Here, it's a parasagittal section, but doesn't matter. What you have to see is that they are white spot. White spot are voxel, which are activated both when the person is uh, stimulated with a disgusting odorant, or when he sees this guy here that show disgust. In other words, the same voxel takes care, the same voxel, so exactly the same group of neurons are activated both when you are disgusted because you are stimulated or you see or you have an odorant, or when you see a person which are disgusted. In other words, it's something which put together others and myself. You are like myself. That's extremely important because that's true not only for disgust, it's true also for fear, it's true also for laughing. So the mirror mechanism allow the two person be in the same state and to be in the same state, it's empathy strictly defined. You are feel empathy when you or the other person are in the same state. The same is true for pain, but there is something interesting. We have to comment a bit. Um, to be in the same state, it means that we feel the same thing. It's not something cognitive. Let's imagine that with pain, it's nice. Let's imagine with pain, I go out in the street and see somebody lying on the pavement in pain. Well, I feel immediately something strongly. I, I also feel pain in myself. I try to help you, him, maybe. But it's completely different from what I read in the newspaper that has been an earthquake in Thailand and somebody died, or that COVID ki killed many people in Mexico. So one, it's real empathic feel, and my heart change frequency. I respiration change. So that's really, I am in the same state as the other. The other is a cognitive understanding. I can cognitively understand that you are in pain, or that you are happy, or that you are unlucky, or what you want. But that's nothing to do with yourself. It's a cognitive, like in the other case, as I told you, understand from the inside. Also here, pain understood from the inside. It's when my heart starts to beat, my pressure go on and so on. Cognitive understanding of emotion is something really not very emotional. It's just a reasoning about the things. Here is an experiment showing that pain exists. So people often ask me, but so how we can either improve or, or stop this? Well, that's a very difficult issue because I, I can tell you, you must be good and so on, but it's very difficult. Instead, in the ancient time, using the religion as a method, that's from Levitico. Levitico is one of the book of the Bible. And he said, non ti vendicherai, non serverai rancore. So you have to love the other people like yourself. So that's it's called the... Uh, golden rule, 
And that's the way, in the ancient time, they said, God, from the mountain, and said, do that. But anyway, that's the only way in which you can somehow like the other people. It, it's, uh, it's a very important rule, and it's present in many religions, including Oriental religion, not only in Bible or in the, but, uh, in the um, Vangelo, uh, I don't remember now the word. Okay, now we know many things about the motor system, but there is <clears throat> a new technique, which is called stereo EG, which allows us to go more deeply in the issue. It's, it's a technique which is used in patient, typically in patient which are not responsive to anti-epileptic drugs, and so it's epileptic patient. Most of people who have epilepsy can be cured by some appropriate drugs, but there are some of them which don't, which are not sensitive to drugs. So the surgeon, here the main surgeon is Giorgio Lorusso, in the hospital in Milano, in Liguarda, have a center for eliminating the cause of epilepsy. Epilepsy is typically due in these adult people because there is some focus, either a tumor or a malformation. So if you put away the cause of the tumor, these people which suffer a lot because they have a lot of uh, attack, the attack stop and they, they are cured. The success is 95%, something really great. But what, why the advantage for a physiologist? Why they ask at our help? Because they are doing the experiments in situations which not require this constraint I mentioned before. In fMRI, in all experiments I mentioned before, the condition is non etological. I told you the one has to stay still, not move, and so on. Then there are other two points which I will show you in a moment that data from fMRI are, are correlative data. If I see that a part of the brain increases its activity, well, it may be that that's the seat of this activity, but maybe that's not so. For pain, for example, we have several points which became active and not all of them are really responsible for it. And then something which often physiologists and neurologists forgot is time. So we live in time, continuously, time is fundamental. So how we can overcome these limits of fMRI, etology, correlation, time. So here, uh, how the experiment is rather complex. So first of all, you see the brain here with a series of red spots. Red spot are location in which we inserted or may, uh, surgery inserted electrons. It's important to note that the electrons inside the brain are not painful. We have no receptors for pain in the brain. So you can put all these electrodes in the human and then you put after you put, it, put the patient out of anesthesia, he doesn't have any pain. Then here you have the uh, attempt to find the blood flow. So this is blue instead of red, but that's our vessels. You do also an MRI in order to be sure. And then you put this electrode here. Each of these electrodes can uh, record from several points. So you have a lot of activity. Here it's an experiment where we show based on 96 patients. Of course, they've been collected over the years. And uh, 11,000 cortical leads. And here it's what happens with time. We made the experiment and recorded for a long time. Usually when you do experiment, you stimulate, that's it. Here you see what happens. After 20 milliseconds, we have an activity in correspondence of what? 
all physiologists know are the somatosensory areas. But surprise is after 40 milliseconds, the activation, the yellow one, it's more rostral, it's motor. After 60 milliseconds, there is a lot of activity here in the perisylvian area, which remain on even after 120 milliseconds. That's really a surprise because for perceived pain, uh, touch or what you want, you don't need all this time. So why we have all this prolonged activity? We think, and now we start, we are doing experiment on this point, that that's necessary in order to be aware of your part of the brain. People with lesion in this part are unaware of their uh, arm or hand and so on. So that's something really surprising that the simple stimulus in this case was a simple median nerve uh, stimulation and median nerve stimulation produced activity for 120 milliseconds. The other advantage is that you can allow the patient to move. Here the patient is moving, doing a preparation phase, reaching phase, manipulation reaching phase. And the same thing can be done also by the experimenter. So we can... There is some interference. Okay, I go ahead. Now, look what happens. Ludovica, can you do something? Can we go ahead? Cosa sta succedendo? Some mic, some mic are open. Uh, could you close the mic, please? C'erano dei microfoni aperti, probabilmente faceva un loop. Adesso mi sembra che vada bene di nuovo, no? Ok, possiamo ricominciare, sì. Ok, so I can show you that's an experiment in which the patient is doing an action. So in this case we have a patient acting and then we can have the experimenter doing the same action. Here it's a somatosensory cortex and you can see that there is only activity when it's active, but not doing observation. But the surprise was with this area here, which you call it S2, because the old uh, anatomist thought that it's uh, somatosensory area. Actually, it's much more complicated. But I will show, I want to show you something really dramatic in the sense that one in black is the execution, the same action executed by the experimenter, and the same action observed by done, done by another person. You see that the time course is very similar. So not only the mirror mechanism tell you grasping, but also describe in time the action, which give you much better comprehension of the action observed. I mentioned before correlation errors. Correlation errors, it uh, has been forgotten for a long time. Why? Because when you do the experiments, you see an area became active, you say, okay, this area, it's important for laughing, or this area is important for running. But it could be not so. And a typical error has been done here. Here you see a part of the brain, very hidden, very depth, uh, located very deeply which is called cingulate cortex. So the people proposed that MCC, the blue area here in the middle cingulate cortex, is important for feedback processing, pain, salience, action reward, association, promoter function, and conflict monitoring. So it's incredible that the same area small area in the middle brain is important to so many functions, some of them of higher order. 
Now, recently with the group I mentioned before, we stimulated this part. Oh. Well, I think I will show you later what's going on because it's not here. Anyway, it's not pain. The people, it's uh, scared and tend to go away. Uh, in a moment, I will make a break. I, I insert this. Intracranial stimulation then shows something interesting also. We stimulated a part of this area and specifically what it's called at PAC, P-A-C-C, and the people start laughing. Again, I will show you this in the second part, this laughing part. But what is important now for finishing this first part of my lecture is that when you show somebody, a boy, either laughing or neutral or crying, you have the activation of the same area. So in other words, there is a C site in the brain whose stimulation determine laughing. And when you see somebody laughing, the same area is activated. So it's a classical mirror system for emotion. I will stop here. Then I will show you a couple of slides which were missing here. And then I will talk about creativity. A small stop. OK, <clears throat> grazie. Grazie, Giacomo. Thanks a lot for your first part of the lecture. Um, if you agree, I could, uh, could, yeah. open, could open for questions, uh, two questions. The question now, OK. Uh, um, maybe to, to take a break. Uh, well, there are... A break, because I would like, if I can, to put uh, yeah, yeah. We can stop for five minutes here if you want. Uh, yeah. So later we can uh, start again with the question if the student wants. So okay. if you have some urgent question, you can do it now. Yeah. No, if you want. Are there questions now? Well, um... No, it seems there's no question in this moment. And so I would prefer to take a pause in this case and moving to the end, the questions. Okay, so uh, we stop for five minutes, let's say, okay? Perfect, five minutes stop. Thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Giacomo. Grazie. Okay.
Quando vuoi Giacomo possiamo ripartire? Dovresti aprire il microfono. Adesso? Sì, ti sento perfettamente, sì. Va bene, ancora un secondo. Dunque, adesso devo invertire lo schermo, no? Sì, devo condividerlo. Aspetta, dove è andata la... Bottone verde in basso. Io non vedo il verde in basso. Proviamo a muovere il mouse sulla finestra. Io vedo la mia... Ah, ecco questo. Condividi schermo. Ci siamo? No. Sì. Adesso sì? Sì. Hai c'è scritto parte 2? Sì. Bene. Direi che siamo a posto. Vedete? Sì, sì, ti vediamo perfettamente. Possiamo... Eh. Grazie. Va bene, allora incomincio con la creativity. Well, the definition of creativity is rather complex. If you look at the different dictionary, it's not clear. Often it's a tautology. Creativity is the capacity to create, to, to invent something new and so on. So I put this definition, which is a kind of mixed from different uh, dictionary. And it said the ability to transcend the traditional ideas, rules, patterns, relationships, and to create meaningful new ideas, forms, method, interpretation. <coughs> meaningful new, that's very important, because creativity should be meaningful and something useful. So you cannot take a monkey, put on a canvas, give a color and say, oh, he creates something. The creativity is related to meaningful. Since the time of Helmholtz and Wallace, <coughs> it was clear that creativity is not a monolithic stuff, but it should separate it in different parts. And it's preparation, incubation, illumination, and verification. <coughs> Something which not everybody immediately understands is why preparation is so important for creativity. But if you think a moment, Preparation, it's obvious for science, it's obvious for engineering, it's obvious for creating something, because you must learn a skill. The people are more dubious when you speak about preparation in the field of music, for example, say, well, Mozart started to compose very, very young. And so it's true. But his father was a terrible father, and he learned a lot from him. Uh, the same is true for Rossini, who was also very precocious, but again, both father and mother were musicians, and so there was a preparation. But typically, what uh, laymen think you don't need preparation, it's painting. They say, oh, painting, yeah, just put, you know, these things which make Clay or Kandinsky, everybody can do it, which is not true. Now I give you some example. I don't know if you recognize it, who is the author of this painting. It's in Barcelona, and that is the father of Pablo Picasso. So I think before becoming a revolutionary painter, he started to be a very great traditional painting. Here is another Picasso, 40 years later. It's beautiful, it's completely changed, but he started in the way I mentioned before. 
<clears throat> Here is another painting of a great revolutionary painting. It's Vasily Kandinsky. Kandinsky, when he was young, he, for family reasons, he went to Odessa. And that's the port of Odessa. I think it's a beautiful painting, but there is nothing revolutionary here. Now it's Kandinsky again, but Kandinsky after a period he spent in France. So he changed his style, but still it's rather traditional. And here is Kandinsky as when he created abstract art. So you see, it's a progressive stuff. You, you don't start doing something strange like that if you are not really able to control paintings. Mm. This is true also today. Uh, Jan Faber, who is very untraditional, very provocative artist, he told me that when he was in academy in Antwerpen in Belgium, he spent hours imitating Dürer or imitating Rubens, which are completely different the style of the two. So he's able to do painting like Rubens, painting like Dürer, but then he started to do some strange thing, which I don't have here, but you know. So preparation is extremely important for becoming an artist. And preparation implies something which, again, not everybody understands. Preparation implies imitation. In a sense, it was obvious for Chassel before. If um, Faber was not imitating Durer or uh, uh, Rubens, he, he cannot start his uh, capacity, his originality. So preparation implies imitation. But here it's a problem. When creativity appeared, and if you put in the term I already mentioned that creativity is related to capacity to imitate, you must look which animals are able to imitate. And here is a surprise, practically among primates, only humans are good imitators. Even animals like gorilla and chimpanzee are very weak. These are experiments made in St. Andrews in Scotland with so-called artificial fruit task. So you put in front of a monkey, of an ape, so a very intelligent monkey, you put a fruit which is artificial. Inside the fruit there is something very good to eat. But in order to open it, you have to touch some bottoms in a precise order. If you don't do that, the, the fruit does not open and you don't have what is inside, which is the interesting part. M many animals solve the problem by breaking it. So instead of opening, they try to break it and to, in order to get it. But that's not imitation, imitation. By definition, is something that you have to do exactly as your teacher showed you. So you have to learn it. Now, if you think now about other animals, very few imitate. Some birds can imitate sound, but essentially imitation is something typical of human brain, of human species, of Homo sapiens. And also, it's rather recently from the period of Duvayan industry. Industry is just a part of the Africa where they found these uh, pieces of uh, instrument. They were all identical for thousands and thousands of years. They were unable to make something new. Why? What has been proposed by uh, Ramachandran, I will go back to this in a moment, is that uh, in order to be creative, you must imitate. Why? Because if you invent something and then all around you, all people around you are unable to do it, your invention, your discovery will lose, will be lost. What is the purpose to invent a new weapon if nobody is able to do it? And that's what happened for probably hundreds of thousands of years. So Homo sapiens with already a big brain, with already many other capacity, but was unable to imitate. But if was unable to imitate, 
the culture cannot go ahead. The culture must be based on imitation. If we imitate and the other imitate, the other imitate, it passed from one generation to another. The great leap, when the people start, according to Ramachandran, there are other factors, maybe language, but I, I, I stick about the idea of Ramachandran. About 90,000 years ago, the people start to imitate. And from this moment, the culture start to uh, grow. And uh, at this time, we know that continuously there are new inventions and so on. But in this period, started to be painting on the walls, started to um, uh, religious uh, meet and so on. So that's a crucial. Well, in this book, Ramachandra has, um, tell us what I just started to tell you. But there is something why it start to be imitation in this time. Again, it's the mirror mechanism because the mirror mechanism is able to transform sensory representation of behavior into motor representation. I mentioned before that one, what we studied is actual understanding, one aspect of uh, uh, mirror neurons. But there is another aspect, which is imitation learning. And we have strong evidence in favor of that. Many years ago, we, uh, uh, Jacoboni, we did an experiment in humans recording neurons from uh, uh, recording activity from uh, Broca's area, and we see there is imitation learning. Uh, so imitation learning is something specific, but one can say, <clears throat> But you say before, you said before, actual understanding and imitation learning. There is no contradiction in that, in the sense that if you generalize, you cannot imitate. Imitation, as I said before, is when you put your hand or your arm in a very specific position. It's not in another position, otherwise it's not imitation. So there was an Hungarian, Charlie, which said, how you can have the same thing, the same mirror can do, be involved in imitation and can be involved in actual understanding. And he was right. Actually, there are two sets of mirror neurons which are different. I already mentioned the broadly tuned and the strictly tuned mirror neurons. So the broadly tuned mirror neurons like this one are useful for understanding what you are doing, but not good for imitation because you are generalizing. This type of neuron instead are very good for imitation because it should be exactly the precise movement which has to be imitated by the learner. This mirror in humans it's very rare. So we have found very few neurons strictly tuned in monkeys, while there is experiment that, in, that indicate that they are in uh, humans. Here is an experiment which I carried out with Gino in Parma, which is, and uh, Stefan Vogt. which is really very interesting, it became more interesting with time. So you see, you have a student lying in the scanner and he has to, he has um, the guitar in his hand. And the first condition has observed the teacher doing an, an accord. Then there is a period of rest in which you have to think about it. And event three, he has to replicate exactly what the teacher did. So event one, observation. Event two, it's motor imagery. Event three, it's do the things. The second part of this uh, fMRI experiment, again, there is the student looking at the hand of the teacher. 
But after that, he has to do something completely different. Just grasp the guitar, not to do a specific chord. So two conditions. One you observe, and then you have emitted. One you observe, and do something like trivial, like grasping the instrument. Now, here it was happening here. Look, a condition imitation one. When you see something, you have a great activity of visual areas. You have the activity of the mirror neurons, parietal, and you have the activation of the frontal. In non imi you have practically the same thing. The crucial thing is here. Here is the period in which you rehearse inside your brain what you have to do. So you practically try to do what the teacher showed you. You have an activation again of, in, that's the condition in which you are instructed to imitate. Strong activity in parietal, strong activity in frontal, so the premotor system, uh, the mirror system is activated. But then the surprise, there is also a strong activation in the prefrontal lobe. Area 46 in prefrontal lobe is an area very important for creativity, as I will show you later. But look for non imitation, nothing. It's reset completely. So the same material that you keep in your brain in order to imitate here, it's cancelled. And then there is something we observed recently, looking at this experiment. If you have to, I already showed you here, if you have simply in non-imitation, there is nothing. But if you have to, create something, execution tool, the student is asked not to replicate what is doing the teacher. And it's not asked to do something stupid like taking in his her hand the, the guitar, but invent, create a new chord. You see, between imitation, between imitation and creativity, it's very similar. So what is the explanation of this experiment? When you have to, when the teacher show you the guitar, you look at his hand, you put it in the mirror system, you encode it there, and subsequently when you ask to replicate, the prefrontal cortex said, do it, and you do it. But if the prefrontal cortex said, do something else, instead of imitate, create something, the circuit is practically the same. So the material which has been stored in the parietal lobe is still there in front the lobe. And the prefrontal cortex ask or extract from this uh, sector of the brain a new type of cord. So you see how close this experiment really is beautiful because it shows how close it's imitation with creativity. So imit you have some material and you can put it together in one way, like the teacher told you to do, or in a completely different, and that's creativity. Well, let's go. Now let's go to neural basis. That's curious thing. One, I, you know, the people who were, there are people which are genius, like Einstein, no doubt, it was a genius. When Einstein died, a lot of scientists wanted to see, to look at his brain, but it was forbidden because he said that he doesn't want to be, to have an autopsia. However, I don't know how they found also that he accepted that his brain will be examined it. So the body was buried, but the brain was examined. It. And there was a girl, a lady, in Arthur McMaster University, who had um, before a big experience of, of project, which was very criticized, but it was intelligent. So he asked the permission to relatives and to doctors to make a series of psychological tests in the people which was 
on no sugars will die in a short time. So he can have the brain of the people who is a good painter or the who is a good, uh, I don't know, musician, musician and so on. Well, at this point, he was, she was given the brain of Einstein and great result. That's normal brain, common brain. And that's Einstein brain. So the parietal lobe is completely different. The parietal lobe, it's unified. And so she and others speculated that the genius of Einstein is because the part of the brain, which typically are separated one from another, are unified. The sulcus disappear, and you can have easy activation of different parts of the parietal lobe. Well, this was done in 2001, 2002, but in this year appeared fMRI and uh, MRI and atlas of the brain became popular and people find that brain like Einstein have is just uh, one modification of our brain. There are many people which are not genius, but have this alteration of the parietal lobe. So this, this poor lady was, well, was taken a bit uh, not seriously, but she was a very good scientist. Anyway, there was an agreement that you cannot derive from the morphology the capacity to be a genius or the capacity to be something else. Now, incubation, illumination. Incubation is the period which I mentioned before when you are doing nothing but inside your brain, you are working very hardly to either to repeat what the teacher said, imitation, or to do something else. Then you have, aha, I know how to do it, illumination. And this was studied very much by this scientist, Guilford, and he called it divergent thinking. What is divergent thinking? Here, the, some of the property of divergent thinking, fluidity, flexibility, originality. Well, fluidity is something like that. Imagine that you have a brick. What is the purpose of a brick? To make a construction. But you can say some other purposes, well, it could be to throw away if you, to throw against a policeman, if you are, make a kind of manifestation. Or you can break it in small pieces and use it for other things. So divergent thinking, you have somebody in front of something which classically is, what is a brick? Something for building said, but it can be used for something else. And flexibility is indicate the same, how you can change. So the idea which has been imposed to you, that's for that, and originality. This point of fluidity, flexibility, originality was studied by three great uh, neuroscientists or neuropsychologists. Zangwitz is an English uh, scholar which first said that very important are lesion in the frontal lobe for decreasing your capacity to change opinion. Luria, who is the Russian great social neuroscientist, said that after lesion of the frontal lobe, you become fixed with an idea. It's almost impossible to convince you that what you said before is wrong. It's fixation of sense. So it's disappearance of any possibility to create something new. You accept the fact as they are, and you don't accept to change. And Brenda Miller, she is very famous for her study on hippocampus. Uh, made uh, the so-called Tower of London, a text in which you create something and then you have to decide if it's correct or not. Better I can explain you better. Imagine that you put one piece near the other and the red should be near the red, the green near the green and so on. Then a certain point you do, you learn that, it changed rule. Now the red should be near the blue. The, well, for normal people, it's very easy to understand that there was something wrong and you have to change strategy. For people who has lesion, the frontal lobe, that's impossible. They are absolutely fixed with it. So you see there are evidence 
all of them are absolutely concordant and they correspond to this area 46, which I showed you before. So this area, which this orchestra is the director of modification, which we change from imitation to creativity is here. And that's what they found in humans, in patient. Now there is something really interesting that people often did not believe, but it's true, that the solution of some problem arrived when they were not awake, but drowsy or even sleeping. The most famous is the case of Kekulé. Kekulé was a chemistry professor in Switzerland. But the interesting thing was at a certain point, he declared that he discovered the formula of benzene because during the dream, he saw a snake. Now, unfortunately, I have not bring to you uh, the formula of benzene, of benzene, but uh, it's round. It's uh, like a snake eating its uh, uh, tail. So the people said maybe he's crazy, but recently it has been confirmed that other people, mathematician, for example, working uh, mathematical Poincare also said something. Uh, it's in Italian, but uh, it's easy to understand. He was on holiday, and in the moment in which he put his food into the train, came an idea without my idea before, my thinking before have nothing to do with that. And I understood that the function of Fuchs are identical of that of non-Euclidean geometry. Don't ask me what are the function of Fuchs, but for mathematicians it's clear. So in the moment in he was doing nothing related to his mathematics, but thinking about how to go to holiday, he immediately in, in the brain, he came this idea. And Dehan, it's a good mathematician and also neurophysiologist, reports also cases of other mathematicians who say that they have this intuition in the moment in which were, they were not involved in. It's interesting that the same is true with Ramon e Cajal, which probably is the great anatomist of all time, and there was a rather strong man he thinks that his suggestion, advice for a young investigator, he said, if you have a difficult problem and you are unable to solve it, don't stay night and day thinking about it. Take a holiday, go to the beach, and you will see that at a certain moment, the solution will become immediate. So that um, seems to be a bit crazy. Why you made the discovery when you don't think about it? But there is a reason, because if you are drowsy, let's say, your brain is traveling from one part, from one idea to the other. Freud called it primary processes. When you are not thinking about something, but you are drowsy or... So new association came and they can substitute the dogmatic idea that you have before. Mm -hmm. So the scientists have one difficulty. So there is dogma. He found something that is against this dogma. You have to put it together. But how is it possible that you don't believe something about that? I think because uh, it's interesting that uh, Breton, the French uh, poet, uh, writer, and so on, have the same idea. And he called this, he said, it has nothing to do with uh, Freud uh, in conscious, but we have inside ourselves the capacity to unify ideas in the moment in which you are not involved in dogmatic explanation of what you know. And that's, I think, is very important because I think there are many people who are very creative but are afraid to say something which is against the dogma and they are not creative. Well, I stop here. Thanks, Giacomo, grazie.
Grazie, grazie molte. Uh, the second part of the, the lesson, uh, I, for, from my point of view, is as a way to bring us closer to the to the architecture and the design, actually, and the way through which we have to, in some way, uh, invent, invent uh, maybe uh, to find, to discover uh, the ways uh, able to support, uh, to support humans in their daily, daily life. Uh, and uh, I saw there are a lot of questions raising from yellow hands inside the group. <laughs> and I, first of all, I would like to start with one Kim. Yes, yes. Came from Aisha Fatima, from the panelists. Um, yeah, maybe we could respond later to this regarding the the dreams, the dreams. Huh? I, I would prefer to open directly the question to the student in in the in the uh, the class before and later to the 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 beholders uh, in the in the in the room the other beholders in the room who is the first who is the first uh, I seeing uh, I'm seeing uh, Poja one is asking to enter in the dialogue are there other? What about you? Do you want to get to start? Yes, please. Who is uh, the first? Okay. Uh, hello, Professor. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You can, okay. you can uh, first of all, thank you for your wonderful lecture. I am really um, grateful to you for the lecture. And I have a question regarding um, empathy that you are talking about in your first part. Um, be, um, I mean, some people have less empathy and some people have more empathy uh, or uh, the reaction would be different from person to person regarding how, how you feel the pain or how you feel the pressure of uh, pleasure uh, from the other person. So how can uh, you define that in, in terms of mirror neurons? Because also creativity is uh, something similar to that. Um, while imitating, uh, one person is, uh, could imitate more or pre more precisely, and uh, somebody else uh, could uh, imitate less precisely. So how how do you explain this this uh, aspect? So I think the question is about imitation. So the people are very good in imitating, others are not good. That's the point. And you are right, because you have, I have forgotten to say, of course you have also talent. So Mozart, I told him, was very good immediately because the father was also very severe and compelled him to study. But he has the talent. If he had no talent, although the father was trying to make him a good musician, he will fail it. And it going to extreme, there is a neurological syndrome called amusia, in which you don't recognize the different tones. So music for you are nothing, are just noise. So I think the talent is very important. The same is true for painters. When Leonardo goes to Verrocchio and learn uh, painting there, but he has also a big talent from the very beginning. So there are two factors that you have to mix it talent, your capacity therefore to imitate what the other people are doing, and then creativity, which using what you learned from the other to use it in a different form, in a different way. So this has nothing to do with the number of mirror neurons or um, uh, amount of mirror neurons in the brain? or Sorry, I've not understood the mirror neurons, what? Uh, so this has nothing to do, do with uh, amount of mirror neurons that are present in the brain. Um, I mean, with, I, I want to understand whether it has something to do with the amount or uh, area of, of mirror neurons that are spread or something like that. Yes, I think what you are asking, if there are some mirror neurons which are very good in generalizing the action of others, and they are good for understanding, but they are not good for imitation. For imitation should be mirror neurons which repeat exactly what you are doing. 
this type of mirror neurons, which we call it strictly congruent, because their activity is maximum when it's exactly what uh, what's encoded in the neuron is observed. So that, that's an important point you asked, because mirror neuron often are put all together, it seems they are for understanding or something is that but some of them uh, are very important for imitation okay thank you other questions yes there is a hand there Yes, I saw Andreina uh, as raising the hand. If you go, yeah. you want to go, go. Do you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, uh, thank you, for Professor. It was a wonderful lecture, and I'm really glad I have this opportunity with you today. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, how would you describe the role of mirror neurons uh, what is the role that they play in architecture, on perceiving architecture? And also you mentioned about uh, cognitive and not cognitive, if I understood correctly, cognitive and not cognitive empathy. So I wanted to know if there is um, any of this uh, like not cognitive empathy in, involved on the process of uh, perceiving architecture. Yeah, that's very good. Um, I would limits the term empathy for something which really determines activity of my brain similar to what is your state. So you are in pain, I am in pain. What you call it the cognitive empathy and many psychologists will call it, I don't think it's really, it's really um, empathy. It's a kind of reasoning, it's the cognitive understanding so one of the example I said before, let's imagine that I read that in Mexico, there are many people who died uh, by COVID. Well, it's, it's really, I am very sad for that. But if you look at my biological factors, heart, blood pressure, and so on, it's completely different from when I see somebody on the road, uh, which is uh, wounded or something like that. Uh, so there is a, is it some kind of uh, terminological thing? So the, the other thing which I would stress, but many people think that be empathic, it means to be good, which is again, not true, absolutely. There is a very curious study made in Chicago about the people in jail. And there are people in jail which are sadic, are there because they killed somebody with sadism, not just killed it but also made this horrible thing that you can imagine. And they are very good in recognizing emotion. So there is a kind of black empathy. They understand emotion much better than most of the other people in the jail. And if you think a moment, it's obvious. So if you are sadist and you have a pleasure from seeing somebody suffering, you must recognize suffering. Instead, most people, especially religious people, think that empathy is something good. Empathy means that you will behave well with the other people. It's not true. It may be so, it may be not. Empathy is neutral. You recognize the state of the other. Then it depends. If it's your friend or your somebody that you know or somebody that you like, of course, your behavior will be to help it. But if you are a sadist, you recognize that he's suffering and you will try to make him suffering even more. So I see empathy is a complex. About with architecture, I never studied this issue, but I think what you say about empathy, it what a certain building, the space of certain building, uh, make you feel you feel good you feel sad you feel uh, there is a church by botta the architecture from Mendrisio, 
which you go inside and you see immediately there is something great. Uh, you are not uh, the, 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 the God. It's, there is something much greater than you. And it's nothing. You just feel that when you enter inside this strange uh, atmosphere which he created uh, in architecture. And I think everybody, one go in the Gothic cathedral, feel that there is something going towards the sea, towards God, towards something superior. The Gothic cathedral are especially good in that. Thank you. And, and maybe something that you have to study you know, or with Vecchiato, with other people. What, what is this feeling of benessere or feeling of malessere that you feel in something? Rather with EEG, maybe studying with uh, fMRI to see what kind of brain became active if you feel that this building is very pleasant. Maybe that could help to do other building imitation. Thank you. And and how would you describe the uh, the role that mirror neurons play um, when perceiving architecture, if any? Well, actually, they are especially done in order to understand action. So it's rather than architecture per se, maybe some body moving inside a certain building can give you another impression than somebody else. Let's imagine that I walk in this uh, church of Botta, which seems to be not made for walking, but just for praying or for sitting. It's completely different, but it's not mirror neurons, I think. Mirror neurons give you in information if you do something. If you just sit there, uh, mirror neurons are not active. Okay. And, you know, it's difficult to jump from something which has been done by nature in order to understand the action of others to architecture, which is something solid and so on. But I agree with you that architecture, for example, if you go in certain, you feel happy, and you feel unhappy and so on. But how to put it together with mirror neurons? And we have to discuss it. I don't know. It's job, job to do. Thank you. Um, can I go next? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, about the experiment that you, uh, that, um, with the dog, monkey, and human, and how uh, specifically humans uh, have a neural function when it comes to lip reading and recognition of sound. Um, can you comment more on how do you okay. connect this aspect? to the, um, uh, to the create communication side of, I'm sorry? sorry? We are not able to, to follow your speech because uh, probably, uh, I don't know, there's a problem. Uh, Giacomo, uh, prova a chiudere il tuo microfono mentre parla Orion, perché forse sono in loop. Uh, Orion, when? <laughs> yes. Uh, okay. Go, 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 start, uh, speak now, please. Okay. Uh, can you hear me now clearly? No, this no. wasn't a problem. You, you have a problem with your mic, probably. Um, okay, I think someone else can go uh, next. I can fix I, it and come back then. Try to write down the, 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 the question. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll write it down. Mm -hmm. uh, the next uh, could be, we can try to... Uh, Gladys. Uh, There's a question from Gladys. Yeah, yeah thank you, uh, Professor Risolati. Greetings from Texas. Uh, so um, thank you very much for your lecture. Amazing. Uh, so the context really matters. Uh, so when you say that uh, the, the, what happened is a distraction, maybe there is something that is released in the frontal lobe, what you show in that area. So is, is attention, is it what we need to explore to kind of release um, the, the idea or the dogma, as you mentioned? Um, so maybe that, that is the kind of uh, uh, intention that we need when uh, buildings are designed to be able to grab the attention of the person so th there is a release of uh, fixed ideas. 
you, you are, but that's a bit opposite of what the, the people, the mathematicians said. They think that your attention should be not directed to what you want to achieve, but rather to wandering around about other things. In this way, your fixed idea, A is connected with B, it's not connected A with B, but could be connected with C. And then you create something new because the context A became con connected with context C. Might yeah, so the building should be, uh, so a building wanted to somehow promote creativity should be able to uh, create the distraction of the fixed idea, right. driving the, the frontal lobe to pay attention to other in a, in a more relaxed way. I don't know if it's stress is the is the is the issue also you said at the beginning is very true you have in, in a sense to put away your attention from one fixed idea and to be open to see other things so if if you are fanatic of one, one type of architecture you will not become an original architect i suppose so cognitive flexibility also seems to be related to, to, um, to the frontal lobe, obviously. Well, the frontal lobe is the most uh, modern part of our brain. If you think a cat practically finishes with motor cortex, has a very little uh, frontal lobe. We have a big frontal lobe. The other animals have much less. So that's why we are for probably creative and the other are not. Thank you. And just a quick question about uh, life course. So kids are very creative. Uh, do we, is, is there an anatom neuroanatomical basis for changes in creativity or, or is just a matter of expertise in, in a, a acquiring certain imitative process and then the, the, the derivation of this? No, I think the, the, the hope that some people have I mentioned um, the Wilkinson experiment on Einstein's brain. But there is something in the structure of the brain which can you say he's creative, he's not creative. But it's not so simple. It's not just the anatomical connection. <clears throat> it's much more. It's anatomical connection. The context that you said before will happen when you are a child. I think there are several factors which determine. It's something interesting which just said. The architects we are considered creative all of them have a high intelligence but then if you look all more than 125 but then if you look later who is really the star is not correlated anymore so you must be above a certain threshold then you are a good creative uh, architect but to be a superstar is not related anymore to your intelligence somebody could have 170 and to be a normal architect and somebody could have 135 and to be apparently a genius to create something completely new and original thank you so that's interesting because it's not the normal intelligence but that intelligence i mentioned to you before that's of guilford this flexible intelligence that you can move around, have new ideas, new connections. Thank you very much. Now I can have the, yes, I can read the, the question uh, uh, raised by Rain. Mm -hmm. Rain was asking uh, the experiment where the brain function activated in humans uh, observing uh, the lip reading. Uh, barking and monkey sound. Can you comment uh, on the relation this unique aspect uh, in human species and its uh, relation with the creativity? With? The... Creativity. Scusa, cos'è l'ultima parola? Creativity, creatività. Ah, creativity. Well, I think the two experiments are a bit disconnected. One experiment just says what you understand from the inside, and that's again something typically human, but I am not sure that that's related to creativity in art. Uh, I suppose that, I don't know, mm -hmm. 
Teresa di Calcutta was very good in understanding your emotions and I don't, I don't think she was creative. So I, I see a dissociation between this from the capacity to understand people from the inside to be good, also to behave very nicely and to be creative. I think somebody could be really son of a bitch and to be very creative. Grazie. Um, if there's not a question from the class, I would run through. Oh, there is one. Another one? Okay. Uh, yeah, the, me again. Uh, regarding the creativity, um, I, I, I have been uh, reading about it and um, that, well, as we can somehow and maybe that is related to what you were saying about preparation also, that the more information that we collect, even whatever we can learn about anything, it might not be specifically related to what the problem that we want to solve, but the more things that we learn, the, the more we can um, have sources of information uh, to solve a problem creatively. Um, is there a, a way that you will uh, recommend to like train creativity or is there any other uh, suggestion that you will do or, or do you think it can be trained the creativity somehow? Yeah, what I said about preparation I think is very important because I think if you learn something since when you are a kid it's very useful in the future. When I mention it uh, Mozart or Rossini it's because they started very early to be somehow trained, imprinted by their, uh, of course, they must have some particular talent otherwise, but to, to have a family, to have the school, to have people which give you information, then you can put it together, modify it and so on. So when I show you this uh, experiment we did with Buccino and Vogt, the, the frontal lobe is the director, director of orchestra, we change it, but you must have the instrument and the instrument are in the parietal lobe and they are different things. So if you want to create something, you must this element to put together to create it. So I think what you said, it's absolutely true. There are two elements. One is to have a storage of information and then you must have a frontal lobe which is able to elaborate the storage and to create something new. I think I interpreted your idea. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, there are a question uh, raising from coming from Juan Barrera. Uh, Barrera asked, Greek class have a question regarding the to the modern world and creativity. How can we enhance the power of creativity when we are already constrained by time? and the pressure from the world doesn't allow us always to take a break from the problem in order to process it better. <laughs> no, he's very right. Of course, if you are so busy in working the whole day in order to, to have money to survive, I don't think you have much time for creativity. I think some leisure is important for creativity. I mean leisure, not just to sit and look at television, but the leisure in the sense to read a book which is not connected with your work or to speak with somebody. But it's true, in the modern society, if compel you to work hours and hours, the creativity will decrease. Yeah, otium, in the Latin word, they were used to name uh, with otium. Uh... Bravissimo. Otium is exactly the period in which you create. Mm -hmm, exactly. The Otium was the, the creator, mm -hmm. according to the, the right of the Latin right. When I mentioned this great mathematician and chemist and so on, they said the same thing. A certain Otium is necessary. I, I must go to Poincaré, who was a great mathematician. I must go to Austria to have a walk in the forest. And then my solution came out. See, because you have to gain a sort of meditation state, uh, 
meditative state in some ways. Well, I don't know if meditative is the appropriate, but something similar. Something similar, something similar. I don't know how maybe somebody here knows better than me how to define meditation. I see some Indians or Oriental, maybe they are more expert than me. Absolutely, there are, we are some. Um, but anyway, mind, mindfulness is a, not, is a the term that uh, uh, in, in the Western culture we are using to depict uh, in some way a sort of meditative approach to to the to the to the clarity, okay, we could say, to the clarity of the concept. Because in, the, in that condition, you can gain that state uh, very close to the optium. Mm -hmm. We have another couple of questions. Um, Orain was asking again the involvement of frontal lobe in imitation uh, in preparation aspects of creativity and our mirror neuron activity in our prefrontal lobe. I didn't understand if this is, is a question of a, a, a note. Uh, no, it was uh, because um, Professor was talking about like answering my question. So I was, it was like a follow-up question because the anatomical aspect of our brain you know, the prefrontal is involved in both the imitation and uh, while we are in experiment and also in the preparation part of creativity. Uh, so I just uh, was commenting that maybe that's why I came up with this question. We cannot uh, understand what you are saying. Sorry. Uh, you have to put probably a hearing on, on uh, yeah. uh, the mic, the mic and hearing. Um, well, another question is coming from from Luis Fernanda Mesti. Uh, do you believe that biophilia may help in distraction? Biophilia? Do you, you, you believe by the biophilia may help in distraction? Uh, distraction. Biophilia, do you know what I mean biophilia? Biophilia is an approach uh, um, proposing to involve in, uh, nature in uh, in in the design of environment shortly so you ask it if a specific environment is positive for creativity that's the question in destruction in destruction and i can i, I can i can try to tra translate uh, luisa is asking if you believe that uh, the presence of nature uh, may help to uh, in distraction, in distraction, to... Well, the presence of nature is a bit vague. I told before that this great mathematician said, that go to the nature, go away from the lab. It can be useful for creativity. But in general, if I have to work here or I have to work in the forest, I don't see a big difference for me. I don't know for you, but... Uh, why should be better a certain environment? If if what you consider forest or ozium or what you, you said, like something which put you away from the traditional way of thinking, yes. If you put simply nature versus my house, I would say no. Okay. Another question. Unless you have some data on that, I don't know, because I don't know this issue. If you have some evidence that... Uh, no, there, there, are, is, there are some evidence uh, regarding the, the, the role that nature can address on, uh, for example, the um, physiological outcomes. Uh, the physiological outcome can be um, strongly reflected by the, also the, the visual, the simple visual, visual uh, perception of the nature and, uh, and naturally also the presence, the physical presence of nature around. But this uh, recent uh, research in, in the biophilia sector is a specific field that uh, raised uh, recently in the last uh, couple, couple of decades. 
There are another question coming from Mattia, um, an, an open question. While answering, uh, while answering the first question asked by Johanny, uh, Professor Rizzolatti said that it could be very interesting for us to investigate what kind of buildings or of space generated state of benessere, well being, or malessere to the visitor. Mm. I think that's a very interesting issue. I tried to suggest to Vecchiato, I hope that he will accept my suggestion, because I am sure that the feeling is completely different if you are in one building or in another building, even if you walk in a building. But I, don't, I am afraid that EEG it's, cannot give you a final answer, can give you some suggestion. Instead, the um, fMRI or other technique more sophisticated, you give you what part of your brain is happy when you are in a, in a nice cathedral and why you aren't happy if you are in a, in a dark environment or something like that. I think that's something which can be studied from the neurophysiological point of view. Mm -hmm. You don't agree? Personal, no, surely we are, we, 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 with the we are working on, you know, uh, we are working in the Parma lab uh, with the um, Paolo Presti, the Caruana uh, Anzini, we are working on the experiment and recently we gained uh, the, the outcomes for him. It's uh, able to depict that, uh, to describe uh, sufficiently clearly that uh, the, the shape of environment can affect the, the, um, the mood of people. The, the, the absolutely, mood. absolutely, you're right. So yeah. We are arriving to the fine and progressively we think uh, uh, that will uh, gain a, also a more, more precise way to, to capture the way through which the particular kind of organization of dynamical perception, because dynamical perception is a very important, um, is, a, is, a, is able to... Dynamical, you mean something which is in the building or that you are walking inside the building? We are walking inside the building because normally we walk, so we move up through the, the space uh, and integrating progressively different uh, uh, vestibular and proprioceptic signals from the interaction with uh, the space uh, and, uh, and able to uh, rebuild uh, retroactively some kind of uh, uh, motor activation. Mm -hmm. And motor activation retrieved can be uh, the support to uh, produce the simulation, to embody, embody simulation. In, uh, in, the, in the environment. We are working on also this approach uh, to establish the way to uh, regulate emotions inside the perception environment. Interesting, yeah. The, the, the affordance uh, concept uh, in, uh, in the peripersonal and the uh, model of interaction in the extrapersonal space, because in the peripersonal we can uh, take account of the um, suggestion coming directly from the object, uh, because now an object can, can activate uh, immediately a, a, a simulation, uh, as you showed uh, previously. Uh, in a, or in an extra personal space, uh, the, uh, a model of interaction that we developed along the, the evolution with space uh, can be used to evoke, uh, to evoke different kind of sens sensory, motor, sensory motor program. Well, uh, another question is coming from uh, um, Mattia Bolondi from the public. Secondly, do you think that a possible outcome of this investigation would be discovering the fact that some kinds of architecture are wrong, which means all visitors always feel bad inside them? <laughs> Well, of course, there is uh, the almost variability from one person to another and also variability from one culture to another. However, there are probably some invariants. For example, I, I read, I don't know if it's scientifically proven, that everybody likes very much some landscape in which, which is similar to Savannah, in which there is one tree, a bit green, and uh, and that seems to be valid for people from Western Europe or from America or from Asia. It seems something which remains from our old ancestors 
which like that kind of uh, environment. But uh, I think it's changed a lot from one person to another. Sure, sure. Uh, yes, we are working on a lot on uh, the savanna, like... Uh... You know that about the savanna, which is considered very beautiful for civilization. <laughs> People for civilized people. I, I'm boring. I'm boring a lot of students with the savanna-like landscape hypothesis of a wagon, and, and <laughs> because I, I'm well, found. It's true, isn't it? it? Seems true. Yeah, it's true. It's true. It seems true. Some, some, many evidence uh, are supporting this hypothesis, and so it is true. Till now, <laughs> till now, I mean, for the moment. Um, Another question coming also, uh, Albornoz Ioanni, um, it seems to me that I uh, already uh, knew this name. Um, uh, Ioanni, ah, Ioanni, you are you, Ioanni. Gave <laughs> another question from Ioanni. Ioanni is the most, uh, <clears throat> active, most active, more the most active, uh, active, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the class today, uh, this afternoon, uh, given uh, mirror neurons are uh, specifically related to movement and understanding of movement. And emotions. And the most. And emotion. If you think at etymology, emotion is also motion. Yeah. And not specifically, uh, not specifically connected to unmoving elements. Um, how come they are so popularly related to architecture and narrow architecture. Well, it's, I don't know. Certainly, I said that they, they are essentially for movement. Sometimes the movement is, is implied. For example, there is, I don't remember who wrote about Michelangelo in Cappella Sistina. There is the God and the creation of Adam, and they don't touch the finger. The fact that they don't touch give you more movement, although they are static. So there are some conditions in which the impression that you got from painting or sculpture of movement, although there is no movement, so we imply also movement. Architecture should be an implied movement because nothing moves, I think. Mm -hmm. Yes. I completely agree with you. <clears throat> yes. Um, like, uh, this is like expression of tension. Yes, in a sense, it's a tension. Some artists are able to create the tension, which gives you idea of a movement and there's something happening. Others are purely static and the aesthetic values, in one case, in another, it depends. Piero della Francesca, for example, is completely static. You have no idea of movement. Bernini is movement. So I, I think it's difficult to say what you should be good in a certain way, but not in only one way. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Uh, Risolati, um, so your, your findings really support the use of virtual reality. For example, we, we could, um, and, and there are a lot of people studying virtual reality too, and then you, you can actually do this uh, uh, neurophysiological studies uh, about the different buildings and the experiences. About building, no, I don't know about building, but in medicine, for example, if you want to rehabilitate somebody and you show movie, it's much less effective than if you show in virtual reality. The strongest is the personal relation between you and me, because it's, there are many other factors. But if I have to compare, to show a patient a video, or show a, a patient uh, in a virtual reality, it, the virtual reality goes more deeply inside him, in his motor system and in his capacity to react. So virtual reality is a good, a big, a big advantage, I think. I don't know how you can use virtual reality in architecture. Well, the navigation. Um... The navigation, you think? Well, mm -hmm. well. Yes, we are we are using a, frequently a virtual reality in architecture now to design because we can uh, test in advance uh, the the 
responses of users uh, according to some uh, protocol and paradigms so that we can create. And mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As we are doing, uh, for example... Reality is a good thing, it's not a bad thing. <laughs> it is a way, way to, to create two different uh, uh, conditions uh, and that you can compare perfectly uh, using, a, a, using a, a sample of uh, beholders, a group of beholders. Uh, and you can, you have, can, you can, you could have a control, a strong control of the condition, which you test using the virtual reality. This is the another long, long question. I have to sit down comfortably to read it. Well, Julia, Julia Rapizza, it's not, uh, it is not a very scientific question. This is the premise, but I will ask anyway. Aristotle. You had the imitation, mimesis, as a fundamental expression of our human experience within the world, as a means of learning, as a means of learning. Later, Adorno, from a biological point of view, say imitation allows humans to make themselves similar to their surroundings environment through assimilation and play. But socialization and uh, rationality usually suppress the natural behavior of man. But no, but socialization and sorry, Julia, uh, socialization and rationality usually suppress the natural behavior of man. Point. In this sense, um, could we argue that uh, in the case of art, where art is mimetic of nature? The work of art is uh, positively perceived by the brain because it implicitly allows for a reconciliation with nature. Complex question. I don't know the question, but about the art, there are two types of art. One, which I would say is bottom up, and the other is top down. So for many, years, I think, the idea was that you have to imitate the nature and better you imitate, better artist you are. But since the beginning of the century, I think also vice versa is true. Clay said that art is not what you see, but what is coming from you and the other will see. So in a sense, it's not you see something and you have to replicate in a better way, but sometimes it's something which coming from your brain and then it became a visual art. Uh, about Aristotle, uh, I think that we are social animals for sure. You see now that uh, the social be social is more difficult. How many people suffer from that, especially adolescents and children? So we are social animals, and there is no doubt about that. And all mirror units are about sociality. Ma, uh, maybe I would I would like to to link my 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 work uh, to yours uh, in order to find a way to maybe to find an answer because maybe I understood the question as a uh, the purpose the the suggestion to see the architecture potentialities potentialities. Uh, in order to produce uh, some um, flows of perception, flows of perception, um, uh, similar to the flows of energies in the natural, in some ways, because uh, uh, what we what what distinguish nature from uh, uh, the artifact, the the building, the artificial object is, uh, is the, the life implied into the, the natural and the forces that run through the natural when you perceive nature, when you stay inside nature. So what I think can be translated inside the architecture in some ways uh, is not, uh, um, it's not a, a similarity to uh, a, a too simple similarity in terms of shapes of natures, because the sh not the shapes, but it is the, the dynamics of forces 
of the natures that we can translate inside the perception. Because they, along the perception that you can uh, build a uh, uh, moving inside the space in architecture, you can produce uh, a variation, a, a continuous shift and modification of perception that can retrieve in some ways natural patterns that you see in the natures as when the branches of, 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 the, of the trees moves uh, uh, um, according the, the flows of hairs, uh, of winds, uh, and of you, the, the body movement to move in the space. You can bring from the nature some model of uh, forces uh, interactions inside the space not uh, uh, in mimetically translating the natural shapes of, in, the, in, in the architecture, because architecture remain tectonic uh, tools, remain tectonic uh, construction, and, but you have to translate some kinds of dynamics, uh, natural dynamics inside the place. You have to bring the life inside architecture. This, this, this is the, 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 the way that that we have to use and to implement inside the design of, of the architecture now, I think. But when you, when you talk about architecture, what you mean, space or the external aspect? Because space is, of course, dynamic. I mentioned it before, the, the Gothic uh, cathedral, which is completely different from a Romanic cathedral in terms of space. I'm, I'm referring to the space, particularly the space. The, in, the indoor space, because the, 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 it should, every time we design, we have to start from the interior, from the space perceived by people, because we spend 90% of our life inside building, and we have to start uh, designing the interior of the building, not the, the skins, uh, the brilliant skins uh, uh, as a star, uh, as our architects are, uh, doing uh, in the last decades, uh, uh, focusing the attention uh, mainly, mainly in, in, in the skins of, of the building. Um, we have to start inside the building. Uh, we have to start from the perception of people and the dynamical perception of people in the moving in the space. In, in, along the movements into the space, we can rebuild, we can rebuild a dynamic and uh, uh, the flows of energies that the nature uh, is a, is a why nature is a typical example of this kind of flow flows in the, in the, in the world. Okay, can we stop here? Yes, I think we can we stop here. It does another uh, couple of questions, but if you want to stop here, because I suppose you are a little bit tired because you are- I'm tired because it's from two to four. So practically the day is endless. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. I'm sorry for the last two questions. But uh, if you ask another couple of questions, I can answer. Okay, 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 okay. I go, well, I go. The last one. One very intelligent, please. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not able to find the and to recognize the intelligence in, into the question. <laughs> but I, yes. I, I my eyes and I go with my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, no, no, I... It doesn't matter. Thank you very much for your question. It was very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We could run again and move again to, to with questions, but I think now you are a little bit tired. So if you want to stop... Uh, I would uh, like to stop now. I think that... Uh, it... Goodbye to everybody. Thanks a lot, Giacomo, again, for your presence here at NAD Master Course. I, I want to thank you also the, the, the guests from, uh, from outside and from Brazil and from other countries that are uh, connected with us uh, and also all the students that are naturally connected from all the world because we are a student come listening us from India to here from India to Texas for example. Well, um, <laughs> Well, so he asked me a question from Texas, so you know that we have. Va bene. Va bene. Grazie. Va bene. Grazie molte, Giacomo, davvero. È stata fantastica questa lezione. We recorded the, the lesson so we students can return back when they want and to 
to give a look and to refresh and make 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 notes about it. Yeah. Thanks a lot to everybody.